So my name is Burke Hoffnagel. I work for Doherty Business Solutions. And as it happens, I'm actually currently uh, working on a project for the Home Depot. And I can tell you, they're switching over. And they're starting to do a lot more agile work, agile development. Um, and uh, we recently got to move into an area where they've renovated. So it's a nice open plan. You can pair, you can stand. It's a good place. Um, but the talk tonight is about automated testing and, and automated development. Um, sorry, automated testing and development. And what you learn here could work if you're working for someplace like Home Depot or if you're working for a startup because it's all about making you more effective. Okay? But it's going to require you to make a little bit of a change in how you think about things, and that's why this is up here. Um, this is called a Necker cube. Right? It's like a little wireframe cube, but there's no clues as to what's the front or the back. So if you look at that, you should be able to see something like a 3D cube, right? Can you see it? But there's, there's two different things. Um, sometimes it looks like this square is in front, and sometimes it looks like this square is in front, right? It's just sort of switching on you, because your brain is trying to figure out what am I seeing here. It's a little more fun if you look at it like this. Can you still see the cube, everybody? Yeah? OK. There's no cube there. There's no wireframe there. If you look at this, right, you've got these little purple shaded rectangles or, or slices of pies. And there's just space. There's no line there. But your brain fills that in for you. right? Our brains are really cool at this stuff. Um, what it's doing is um, edge detection. right? That's how you find where the ends of things are and stuff. So your eyes have been around for a long time. You're used to seeing things like this. And you go, oh, I see that. So here's the fun part. You see the cube, the little white cube up there, right? Imagine, if you will, these are actually holes in a surface. right? And you're looking through the surface. And the cube is behind it. Can you see that? Yeah? There's nothing there. Your brain is making it up. And the only reason you're seeing it is because I've suggested to you that that's a surface and you're looking behind it. Changing how you think about it changes what you see. Right? Your viewpoint can change just by changing how you think about something. And it works that way with software, too, and how we do things. Um, and we'll see in a minute how. Things have changed over time as we change our perspective. Um, this is called on-beyond testing. Um, that's me. Lots of stuff to explain to you why you should listen to me and believe what I say. right? Um, but this is more about you. So I'm guessing that most of you are Java developers. right? Um, might be doing some JavaScript. And you're interested in some automated testing stuff and maybe figuring out how to be a little bit more efficient at what you do. This is the key. We want to deliver better code in less time. It doesn't matter how fast you write the code. right? If you can write the code in 10 minutes, and you put it to QC, and QC takes two days, and they come back with some bugs, and you have to fix it, and you take another 10 minutes, and you hand it back to QC, and, and after a couple rounds of this, they finally check it all through, and it's good. Well, it's taken you a week and a half to get it through QC. right? But you only spent an hour writing the code, versus if you spend maybe two hours writing the code, and it goes through first time, now it's only been a two-day process. right? You've saved a big chunk of time for your company, which means you've saved money, and you've saved yourself a lot of hassle. Because if you write code, and you get it back two days later, and you have to figure out what's wrong with it, how easy it is to remember what you were doing? Not so much. right? But if you write the code the first time, and it goes through, right, then you don't have to deal with that. If you can find the bugs quickly, and fix them before other people have a chance to interrupt what you're thinking about, you can fix them a lot faster, because it's all in your head at that point. You know what you were thinking. You know what you did. Right? So we'll see how this works. There's our goal. Also, understand tests are not enough. Tests are really good, but they're not enough. Um, and we're going to identify and tighten your feedback loops. So because we're developers, we want to say, you know, make sure we've got the same terminology. Right? A manual test is any test that involves a human being. So if it's somebody who's got a script that they're typing things in and going, yes, it's working right, or if it's an automated test that does everything but at the end does some system out print lines and puts some stuff on the screen, and somebody has to look at it and go, yeah, I think those numbers are right, right? those are still manual tests. Even if it does everything else but the assertion part, the, ver the verification that what's happening is correct, it's still a manual test, because somebody's got to look at it to know whether it's right or not. And there's problems with that. You have to have knowledge of what's supposed to be coming out. And sometimes it's an opinion. Well, I suppose that's the right number. Yeah, it could be that. That's good. Um, 
and it's slow and error prone compared to a machine, right? Because the computer is going to do the same thing every time as long as you're not running Windows. Um, automated tests are code that has the machine decide, did it pass or not, right? And that's the key piece. It's going to be more efficient. It's going to be faster. Uh, your test should be based on your project requirements. You'll get fast, accurate results because that's what computers do. They take manual processes and they automate them. They make them quicker and more accurate. So tests are not enough because your test can't prove that there's nothing wrong. It can only prove that what you're testing is working right. right? So if you leave out something, if you forget to test a, a, a possible branch in the code, or if you don't know about a feature, or if the requirements for the feature change, right? your test is still doing what it's supposed to, but now it's no longer the right answer. So your test by itself is not enough. Um, so it, it's always looked like this, right? You start off, you read the requirements, and then you figure out what to do, you write some code. And then you manually test it, make sure it all works. OK, everything is good. If you find a problem, you go back, and you figure out what was wrong, you write some more code. So this is a feedback loop, right? Everybody's familiar with feedback loops? This is where you chime in and say yes? No? Yeah? OK. <laughs> Just want to make sure. I know it's, it's been a long day. Um, OK, so once, you're, once you think it's all good, you turn it over to QA, right? And they find bugs, and they hand it back to you, and you have to decide what went wrong and fix that, and, and you go through the loops. And each one of these loops is a longer period of time, right? Because turning things over, and somebody else has to pick it up, and it may not be their top priority. They have other things to do. They find the problems. They give you a list of problems, and finally gets back to you. So you get the second loop. Finally, it goes through QA, and then it goes to user acceptance testing, and they find bugs, which may just be a requirement change, or, oh, I forgot to tell you, uh, in this case, it's not supposed to do that. It's supposed to do something else, right? So you have to go back and fix it again. Round and round we go. Eventually, it makes it to production, and of course, the customer finds bugs too, because that's how code is, right? Um, when I finished this slide, I was depressed. Uh, you know, I thought about it, I was like, wow, we really do all that stuff, or at least we used to, right? Things have gotten better over time. So it got better, and now we still have this process, but then somebody thought, hey, we should write automated tests, because that way we don't have to keep doing this stuff. So we slipped in this whole idea of writing automated tests. Right? JNUT came out. Um, there's similar XUnit uh, frameworks for almost any language. Right? Um, but then you, know, you still have to find bugs. So there's another loop in there. And the rest of it keeps going like it did before. But we've got that extra little piece in there to, to make things a little better. And it does, right? particularly for the guy who comes behind you, because you know, they've got tests there to help make sure that if, they, if there's a problem and they break something, or if they're making an enhancement, it all still works, right? Um, the problem, well, the problem with it is there's not a lot of incentive for you to write those tests, okay? So let's take a look at what, it, what something with this, like this would look like. Um, we've got a class here, and you can't see from the bottom it got cut off, um, but this is actually from the JUnit uh, SourceForge website. Uh, so this is a sample. We've got a class called Money. It has two properties to it. Uh, Floating point amount, an F amount, and F currency, right? I don't know, the Hungarian notation or something. Um, and then you've got a constructor, a comparison, no, constructor, uh, and ways to set the values. So, what would a test, what would a unit test look like this? What would a unit test for this look like? I can say this. Um, well, normally, that's what it's going to look like for most code, right? Because people don't write a lot of tests. But if you did have it, and these people did, it would look something like this. Now, this is a, an example. So they're declaring two instances of money, F12CHF and F14CHF, very useful names. right? In the setup, they create an instance of F12CHF. Well, they populate it, right? And oh, there's the reason. It's because it's 12 for the value and CHF for the, the uh, currency. And 14 has 14 in CHF. And then they've got a test here, test equals. What does this do? Assert true, not F12CHF equals null. OK, so they're saying F12 shouldn't equal to null. That makes sense, right? Um, assert equals F12, assert equals F12. So F12 to F12, those should be equal. One thing should be equal to itself. Then they've got this one, F12 to a new instance with the same values. That makes sense. 
And they've got this last one, assert true, not, OK, not true, f12 equals f14. So you can kind of figure out what it's doing, right? Do you notice it's missing one test? There's an equals it's missing. Anybody you know what it is? No? OK, so here they're checking to see if the, if the units match. Or, well, if the units don't match, they shouldn't be the same. But they don't check the currency. So with this test, you could have something screwed up where the currency test never happens, and now you're adding dollars and pounds and getting, you know, who knows what. So with tests like this, it's hard to read. It's kind of hard to understand what it's doing, and it's easy to miss stuff, right? It does help that they're following sort of a pattern here. You can say equal to its, you know, not null, equal to itself, equal to something with the same values, and then not equal to something that's different. Right, but they didn't, and you can kind of see, oh, yeah, there's another pattern that's missing. They could have set a tert false on the equals, right? They could make it a little easier to understand, but it's a test. And then they've got a, a test here that adds the values, right? No test to make sure that you're adding dollars and dollars or pounds and pounds, but it's better than no test at all, right? And this is the kind of stuff that you'll have with legacy code, because when you write code and then you have to write a test for it, the first thing your brain says is, why the heck am I wasting my time writing a test for something I've just written and I know it works. Right? There's no value there for me. I mean, I've spent an hour with this. I've worked through it manually. I've played the part of the computer and looked at all of it. Everything works great. And now I'm going to write all these manual tests for it, all these, all these automated tests for it. Right? What's the point? I could write a new a feature. I could fix another bug. There's lots of things I could do that are more valuable than that. And that's true for me, the person who's writing it. For someone who's coming in later has to fix it, this is invaluable because it shows me how to use it. It shows me what it does. Right? It's just that for the guy who's going to do the work, there's not a lot of benefit. Of course, it may be you in six months, so it could be benefit. Right? But that's what things looked like then. So wow. On this screen, you can't read this, can you? Um, it says, write automated unit tests. And that's where we were. So that was the difference that happened. And then people looked at tests, and they found a few things. Um, these outer uh, empty boxes, like trustworthiness of tests, reliability of tests, these are things that are important for, t for automated tests and for your productivity. Right? Because the speed of the test execution shortens how long your feedback cycle is, which makes you more productive. The longer it takes to run the test, the less likely you are to run the test in the first place, but also the longer it takes you before you get any feedback. So there's some nice things here. Tests need to be readable. Right? You saw going through that other unit test there, it's trying hard to figure out what some of those tests were doing. Um, makes it hard to debug. So you want good readable tests. You want, they have to be reliable. That's critical. If you have broken tests and you leave them in there, people should shoot you. Because I can't trust your code now. Does this test fail because there's something broken? Or does this test fail because you made a change and forgot to fix the test to make it match? Right? It's, it's really frustrating. So you've got to be able to trust the test. You gotta, they have to be reliable. They should give the same result every time. So if you're doing something like an integration test that depends on data in the database, and you don't make sure that the data is set before you run the test, sometimes they're going to break, and you don't know why. Is it a code change, or is it, oh, I forgot to reset the data? Okay. So you have to make sure all of that stuff happens. So. We had this kind of test where we were, were, or process where we were writing these tests at the end. And uh, somebody thought about it and went, well, OK, if I'm writing the tests, why do I need to manually test things before I write the test? Well, I just write the test and then do that. And that gets one of those loops out of the way, right? So now I've got feedback sooner for my, for my automated tests. It's still kind of annoying to write the test, but now there's some more benefit to it in that. You haven't just spent all this time making sure it works and then write a test. You write some code, then you write the test to check it and see does it work properly. Right? So yeah, that's a bad, on this screen, it's a bad color combination. Um, you're finding fewer and fewer bugs here because you've got these automated tests in place and your feedback loop is shorter. Right? And because the feedback loop is shorter, you're catching more tests quicker. You're making fewer mistakes because you've got some tests to help you make sure that you get things right the first time. So you go fewer iterations through the loop. And when you do, there's fewer bugs for the, for the folks to find. So this helps you get better code delivered faster. Well, people took a look at this and went, huh, write the code, then write the test. What if, what if you did it the other way around? What if you wrote the test first, 
and this is test first programming, you write the test first, then you write the code. Okay, That was kind of interesting. Um, of course, the problem was, well, how do you know what test to write? You know, um, it, it gets to be a little weird. So, but when they did this, when people who wrote their tests first found that they had fewer bugs. Part of it is because, as you saw in that, that unit test, when you're writing the tests and you start thinking about, oh, what do I need to fill in, your brain will help you fill in the patterns, just like it fills in the edges for the wireframes, right? Your brain's like, okay, I've got this and this, there's a hole in my pattern. Oh, I'm missing to check to make sure that the currencies are the same. Okay, cool. And you put that in, that's one less bug to get found. So this is all talking about unit tests, and, and I, I highlighted that because um, when, you're, when you're doing your initial testing, you're initially writing the code, you don't want to try and say, okay, I'm going to make this one line change, now I'm going to compile my code into a jar file, put that into a WAR file, just you know, put that to my server, well, I've got to stop the server and clear out all the work files, right? deploy it, start up the server for a one line change. It's just, it's just too much work. So you want to do it in your unit test because it's fast. Right? We were trying to keep, the, keep this, these uh, cycles small, quick cycles. Anybody know what this is? Okay, um, this was the Mars Climate Orbiter. Uh, it went out to Mars in 96, I think it was. I've got the information. 99. It cost $125 million. You've never heard of it because it burned up. It was supposed to make a shallow pass through the atmosphere and get some information, and instead it made a deep dive and burst into flames, and we didn't get anything out of it other than maybe a little fireworks. Um, and the problem was there are two different systems. One system was calculating thrust in pounds, and one system was expecting to get the, the numbers in newtons. Okay, So one system says, oh, in order to slow down just enough so that we get the shallow pass, here's the number. I hand you the number. And the other system goes, oh, cool, and takes the number. And both sides know what the units are supposed to be. Not, obviously. Because, um, right, NASA was using metric system, and the contractor was using imperial system. And they're passing just a number. Everybody, well, so communication problems. This is where an integration test would have saved them a lot of money and a lot of embarrassment, right? If you had done one integration test of that system before they sent it, they would have found out that they had the wrong numbers coming. And in fact, during the flight from here to Mars, they, had to, they noticed that there were a higher number of course corrections that had to be made. No one figured out it was because the amount of thrust being applied wasn't correct. Well, test first, integration test, all good stuff. Test driven develop came around, and test driven development is where we say, okay, write a failing test, write just enough code to fix it, and then uh, fix it, make it pass, and then refactor, clean up your code. And that's your first cycle. Everything else stays the same. Who's heard of test driven development? Who does test, who does test driven development? Okay, well that's good, that's good. Was it hard to learn? No, it's not hard. Of course, jogging every day is not hard, right? You can do it, but it's a habit you've got to get into, and at first, it's a real pain. But after a while, you can actually learn to enjoy it. And I say this both as somebody who's had to learn to jog and someone who's learned test driven development, because when I was doing this stuff, it was figure out what's supposed to happen, write the code, manually test, all that kind of thing. Uh, and I can tell you that when I use test and development, and I don't always, because I'm not that good yet, um, when I do it, I get better code, I get better quality code, and it does come out faster. Uh, recently worked on a project. Uh, the idea was we needed to get a, a system out to uh, the store, the retailer, and you know who because I told you who I've been working for. Um, they wanted, we started in early, early September. They wanted to be uh, in into a store by end of January. It was important, right? And they thought that was going to be a, a pretty doable deadline. You know, we might have to work a little bit hard, but we could do it. So we started doing test driven development on this because that's part of what they were trying to learn. Um, and we actually had our first uh, system go live in a store uh, in mid-November, right? So five two-week sprints, and we had a, a, a viable system that we could deliver, right? Half the time that they were expecting. They were thrilled. Their previous system had taken a, a lot longer than that, um, and they were looking to go to XP to actually get more benefit from it. We were able to turn things around because we had all these tests in place. 
really good stuff. So from personal experience, I can tell you this does work. Okay? Um, but this is the system. Figure out, um, write the failing test, write the code to pass the test, and refactor. Um, anybody know this guy? He's not always purple. <laughs> no, Uncle this, Martin. huh? Clean code guy? Yes, Uncle Bob Martin. Um, very smart guy. Uh, he's, he's done these books, Clean Code and the Clean Coder. Uh, he does a lot of thinking about these kinds of things. And he has three laws when it comes to test-driven development. And it sounds pretty intense, but first is you're not allowed to write any production code, not one line, unless you've got a failing test. And the second is that a failing test, right, you can only write enough of a test to fail. And not compiling counts. Okay? And then once you've got that, you're allowed to write, there it is, just enough code to pass the test. Okay, so you don't write a test that's failing and then write two hours worth of code. You write just enough to pass. Okay, and when we say just enough to pass, it's like um, if you're making a call to a system that's supposed to return a number of Fibonacci sequence, uh, in some complex calculation, return zero. We'll make it pass. We'll, we'll make it compile, right? So that's a valid thing to do. Just have it return the number zero, number one, whatever. And now that test, now the system will compile and you can continue on. Um, and if you do this, though, where you're, where you're continually writing just a little tiny bit of code, right? write the test code, write some production code, make it pass, and go through. Um, he says you wind up being in a, a, a cycle that's about 30 seconds long. And that's, I went backwards. There you go. You'll be in a cycle that's about 30 seconds long, and the great thing about this is if you're writing your code and stuff and everything's great and then something suddenly breaks, okay, you've only got about 30 seconds worth of work that you have to undo. Control Z, Control Z, Control Z. It works again. Okay, what did I do wrong here? Right? You're not, well, the last time I compiled it, 30 minutes ago, it was working. So what's happened between now and then that could have caused it to fail? Right? It's a nice short loop. It's easy to fix pretty obvious where the problem is going to be. Um, and the fun part is, um, for, for most developers, if you're using JUnit or any of the frameworks sort of like that, when the tests pass, you get this little green bar, right? And that starts being kind of a cool thing. You like seeing the green bar show up. And every time you run the test and you get the green bar, your brain goes, yes, 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 I'm succeeding. I'm getting something done. It's working, right? And that can be a little bit addictive. Well, maybe more than a little bit addictive. Um, but so it looks like this. You write the failing test, you make it pass, you refactor. Refactoring occurs, refactoring is important. And this is something that a lot of people don't do, right? Um, refactoring your code is where you keep how it functions, but you change what it looks like. You get rid of duplicates. Um, you might extract a method and make it some, so if, you're, if you've got common code in multiple places, you extract that into a single method, call it there, and that way if it has to change, you change it one place, right? Those kind of nice things. It's hard to do that with code when there's no tests because if you do a refactoring and it doesn't work, you don't know what's wrong, right? Or you may not know that it doesn't work anymore, right? If you've got the tests in place, though, if you do a refactoring and you make a change to your code that shouldn't change any of the behaviors and one of the tests fails, you know you've got a problem. You can fix it right then and there. Right. So nice tight, tight feedback loops. Um, so this is test-driven development. This is a wonderful product. If you use Eclipse and you do any kind of automated testing, you should download InfiniTest. Uh, it's an open source project. Right? It's free. What it does is every time your project builds, and if you have, it, if you have the setting for uh, um, automated build, uh, anytime you hit Control S and save a, a change, it will run all of the related tests, right? Not all of your tests, but all the ones related to that file. So anything that it, anything that uh, uh, imports that class, or uses or is used by that class, those tests all run, and you get a notice right then and there um, that that it all passes or that there was a problem. So this is, like I said, this is a very nice plugin. Um, I think they've got versions for IntelliJ as well. Um, don't know how well that works. Pardon? It seems to say that. Yeah. Um, but yes, it's it's very nice. Um, doesn't take up a lot of space and, and gives you feedback quickly. So 
Um, if you're doing JavaScript development, there are similar things. There's nothing exactly like this, but you can set up watchers on your files and have tests run. So there's the test driven development. Turning over to QA, well, right, agile development, separate QA team, you're not really supposed to be doing that, right? You're supposed to sort of blend everything together. Everybody's a tester, everybody's a developer, everybody's an architect, everybody's something of everything. Um, so instead of that, no, nope. I was hoping I had it in, in purple there. Um, this says continuous integration. So something like Jenkins, uh, continu continuous integration server. So once you've got everything passing and you've done all your refactoring, everything is good, check it in. Right? Because you've got good working code at that point, which means that other people can start building on top of that code. They don't have to wait for you to get done two days from now. You've got something that you know works and is worth other people building on top of. Right? So you check that all in. Jenkins does its thing, builds everything, runs all your tests there too, and now you know whether you've incurred other problems with somebody else's system. Right? You may have made a change that, that breaks somebody else's tests. Um, so. TDD sounds simple, but this is a recent, well, couple-year-old uh, quote, right? Easy to explain, easy to follow, so why do so few people actually do it well? It's because you have to change your perspective, right? You're looking at how you're doing things, and now we've got to change things, and it's different. It's not what I'm used to doing. It's not normal. Um, and particularly when you start getting into crunch time and you start working long hours, or you have to work the weekend or overnight, it's easy to backslide, right? And to just start doing things that you know you can get done very quickly and not worry about the test. I'll do the test later. That's where you get the 404 file not found, right? You might get the test in later, but you're not getting any of the benefits from it. So something like this, part of what makes it hard is how do you know where to start, right? How do I know what test to write? Well. It's a good question. And when I first was learning about this, and I thought about this, like, OK, so you know, how do you know what tests to write? The answer that I was given was one I didn't really appreciate much. And they said, well, if you don't know what tests to write, you don't know what code to write. You don't understand your project well enough. I was not happy hearing that. But it turns out that's pretty much true. Right? In order to write the test, in order to write the production code, you have to know what it's supposed to do, right? It's like, well, OK, I need an object that does this. I need a class that does that. I need a service for this piece. How do you know that? Well, the requirements tell you when I need these things. Oh, OK, so you've got a requirement that says you need to have something happen here. Yeah. OK, write a test that says I need to have something happen here. Oh, OK, I can do that. So I write the test as if the code I want to use already exists, right? And then I write the code to make that test pass. And round and round we go. And once there's no more tests that I can come up with to make that happen, it's done. I can check it in. So then this idea came along, behavior driven development. And it's very, very similar to test driven, right? Except now we've got some different words here. Specify existed expected behavior. Write a failing specification. Write the code to meet the spec. We're not talking about tests anymore. We're talking about specifications. What's the difference? OK. Yeah. Specifications aren't source code. Specifications are, this system should do this. Given this scenario, this system should behave in this manner. right? So instead of a test where I've got something, now let's see if what I did is good enough and it passes, it's a future thing. It's, I want this system to do this. I've got a shopping cart, and it needs to handle uh, tax calculations in all 50 states and Puerto Rico. OK, how do I build that? Well, let's see. And you start thinking from the outside of what is this thing supposed to do, as opposed to the inside of, OK, I need a class that does this, I need a class that does that. Da, 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 right? And so you can take the specifications, and that tells you what tests you need. Well, what specifications you need, right? So this is another shift in that perspective. Um, when we talk about tests, we tend to be thinking very much about like J unit kind of things, unit tests. How do I make sure that this is functioning properly? And here's my end results and all. When we talk about specifications, it's more like, well, even the language I was using there, the system should do this. Why should it do that? 
Why shouldn't it do something else instead? Oh, well, there's a business, you know, there's a law that says you have to follow these things. Oh, okay, well, we've got that. That makes sense. Or, I don't know, well, that's, that's just the way we've always thought about it. Maybe there's a better way. Should it really do that? It's, it, it leads to conversations between business people and developers, and while that can be kind of scary, that's really what we need to have more of, right? Because the, the, the business guys, the ones who figure out what the requirements are, right, they know what they want, sort of. Right? They may not know how to tell you what it is, but they'll know it when they see it, right? And if you can talk to them about it, they can see it a little quicker, right? You may be able to sketch something, and they go, oh, yeah, like that. that that's, that's what I wanted to do. Good. You write it down in the specification, and then you use a tool like uh, Spock or like Cucumber. There's, there's some other tools that will actually take a written specification and let you execute that as a test, as if it was a JUnit test, OK? It, it does some, some under the cover work, and you have to put some glue in there. But you can actually take things that are basically an HTML document or a piece of text and turn that into the, ba the, the framework for all of your unit tests, all of your tests to make sure that your system does what it's supposed to do. Um, so BDD, this is Dan North. He's the guy that coined the term. And his take was it's all about right, implementing applications by describing the behavior from the perspective of the stakeholder, not us, not the user, but the stakeholder, the guy who wants the system built. Right. Um, Dan was saying that, that his, the, the framework that he worked a lot on is called Cucumber. And uh, um, his take was that Cucumber is, is very misunderstood. It's not a testing framework. It's a, a tool for collaboration, right? Business people, testers, developers, all working together to make sure that they understand what has to be built. So behavior-driven development looks like this. You start off with the TDD, but then that becomes just a piece of it. So you start off with writing a failing end-to-end -end test. This is the same thing as an automated user acceptance test, right? You have something that says, the system should lock me out of it when I try to log in three times with bad credentials. OK. That's my end-to-end -end test. Then I, you can use that to start figuring out, OK, what do I need? I need a piece that's going to talk to my authentication system. I need some kind of a, a screen that's going to take data, uh, password, username, or fingerprint, or, or whatever. Right? It starts the conversation. How do we, how do we authenticate people? You know, can we use a fingerprint? Uh, can we use voice? Can we use retina scans? Can we use blood samples? Can we use who knows voice? Whatever, right? How are we going to do this? And the people come back with, well, yeah, I don't know. Would, you know, what what can you do? Well, what we have in place now is passwords and user IDs, right? Okay, let's work with that. But here's the fun part. This the specification does not say. When the user comes up to the ATM and puts in their card and takes it back out and punches in their PIN number, then they can do this. It says when the user authenticates themselves. And the reason you do that is the same reason that you use interfaces, because the implementation is not part of it. That's not a business rule. The, comp the, the bank doesn't really care if it's done through uh, you know, PIN numbers or any other thing that's really secure. Right? So if, if they... Uh, you know, if they do come up with retina scanners that are, that are predictable and usable and don't cause people to go crazy, um, then the business rule is still the same. You have to be authenticated. How will you do it? Doesn't matter. So all the high-level specifications can go from one system to the next rewrite to the next rewrite, because until the business rules change, that's valid. Right? Any implementation stuff, that's implementation. I don't care if it's Java or if it's you know, JavaScript running on Node or if it's who knows whatever the next language is going to be. Right? The business rules are still the same. So you write your failing test. You do your TDD piece. When you're done with that, you've got a working piece of a deployable system. Because specifications are about features. Right? It's, I want this to be able to log in. This is the behavior for, for the, the authentication system. Once that's done, that's, that's business value right there. They can use that for something. So TDD is about building things the right way. You get high quality code, easy to understand and maintain. BDD includes building the right thing. Uh, and there's a the particular piece, business needs and requirements. If you look at unit tests, they tend to work this way, components. OK, I've built the authentication piece. I'm going to work on the, the logger here. I'm going to work on uh, the, the uh, 
shopping cart piece I'm going to work on, right? But BDD and functional tests work across these components because you're building features, slices of features, something that works, goes from the front end to the back and returns, right? And so when you're done with one of these features, you've actually got something that works and you can do something with. If you finish one of these components, well, great. Can we ship it? No. I've got a working component, but it's not plugged into anything else, right? So this is another reason why the BDD stuff is a better approach to automated testing. Right? So at this point, if you're doing it like this, you get your features done quicker, which means you get something that you can deploy quicker, right? So you're delivering business value sooner than you would if you work on component by component, right? I've got, I've got components C1 through C5 complete. Everything's awesome. Can we ship it? No. I still got to finish this last piece, right? Versus I've got functions one through four fixed. Can we ship it? Yes. It'll do, you know, 80% of what we need, right? We can't handle Hawaii yet. Bad time zone, right? So it's another way of thinking about things. Working on features versus working on components. Lots of stuff here about testing at the right level. Um, basically, if you write user acceptance tests and you're hitting the UI, you got problems, right? Because the UI keeps changing. People decide, oh, we need to move this, we need to change that. And if your test is tied to the UI, right, every time the UI changes, your test is going to have to be modified. If you write to the level below the UI, right, the level that the UI is calling, things shouldn't be changing so much there. Because whether it's a drop down list or a radio button or whatever, you're still sending the same kind of data back to the end service, right? That's going to that's be a lot more stable. So you write more tests. Write a lot of unit tests, write some integration tests, write very few UI tests, right? Um, and yeah, ice, browser level tests are the icing on the cake. You got to have that foundation in place. Once again, it's all about how quickly can you deliver a code that's working. Um, this is a chart TDD versus BDD, trying to hammer in the idea of building the right thing. If it's right, if you don't build the right thing, you don't build it well. Well, then, then you've got crud. Um, if you do a really good job of building something, but it doesn't provide any value to the business, well, it's a failure. Right? So you've got to get them both in place to be considered a success. Cucumber is a tool that you can use. This is one of the tools that you can use to, uh, to take text like this and turn it into tests. Um, let's zoom in a bit. So and Cucumber actually works on the JVM, so it supports all these wonderful different languages. I don't know what Gosu is. Anybody, is anybody familiar with Gosu? Yeah, I have yet to find anybody who is. Um, but Rhino, right, JavaScript, JRuby, Jython, or Jython, Clojure, Scala, all, all the nice JVM languages, and Gosu. Um, so you start off with this. These are your user stories, right? Um, we'll see. So you've got a description about being a blog reader and what you want to do and the scenarios. These pieces here turn into tests because what Cucumber does is it uses a language called Gherkin. And I don't know who comes up with the names for these things, but um, I guess if you've got Cucumbers and Gherkins, it goes together. Um, Gherkin understands this syntax of given, when, then. Um, it also includes and and but. So given this, and this, and this, when this occurs, and this, and this, then this, and that, right? Um, so it parses this out. and tries to execute. It says, okay, well, so this is good. There's going to be a method, and it needs to match this string. So we'll start with the top one. Um, and what it does is it, use, it creates an annotation based on the line. So I picked the other one here. So given that I selected the post, when I add a new comment with name, email, and body, right? So here's the when I add a new comment with email, name, and body. So it's going. So it's the annotation there is um, looking for. Sorry, Gherkin looks for the annotation here that matches the regular expression off of the original text. Okay, and the reason it does that is so that you can do things um, not on this screen. Um, so if you say, given that I put five books in my shopping cart, it doesn't get stuck with the five. You could change five to seven. It gives you a parameter there that you can pass into your test. And that way, if you change the number, you can change. Uh, you don't have to write a whole new method to deal with that. Um, but 
you get an annotation in the name of the method, and then Gherkin will execute the, the methods as it goes through. And if it doesn't find them, it will actually generate the stubs for you. Um, so you don't have to figure out the regex for this. Um, and you don't have to call it that name. You can call it whatever you want, because the annotation will find it and execute that for you. Okay. So Gherkin will let you start off with the uh, user stories that your PM wants to hand you. Right? You can go through those stories with your business people, make sure that that's really what they want. And the scenarios, you can start getting into details. Well, what happens if it's 10 books? Do they get a discount? Yes. What if it's 9 books? No. OK, so I have two different scenarios there. At 9 books, there's no discount. At 10 books, there is a discount. right? So you're at two different scenarios. And those turn into two different sets of tests. So we've got these, well, I keep saying tests, right? I said it's hard to change your perspective. These are specifications, right? Not tests. It executes stuff that looks like tests, but these are actually design tools for us, right? Because once you know what it's supposed to do, you can start figuring, okay, what code do I want to call for this? What do I want the API to look like? How many parameters should I pass in? I've got six parameters, and three of them are strings. Maybe I should make an object that holds the data instead of saying first name, middle name, last name. I can create a name object, or I can create an address or a person, and pass that in. And now I've got a cleaner interface. Right? Um, it gives us the opportunity to think about what we're doing before we've committed to doing it, so that the code you create is the code you want to use. So this goes to, OK, where do tests fit in then? Anybody know who this guy is? Bruce Lee. Absolutely. What most people don't know, so for those who don't know, Bruce Lee was like one of the greatest martial, art, martial artists in the world, right? Um, I would say better than Chuck Norris, but not to him. <laughs> I'm not stupid. Chuck Norris beat Chuck Norris. There you go. Yeah, he did in at least one movie, yeah. right? But then Godzilla beat King Kong in a movie if you were in Japan, but in America, King Kong beat Godzilla. Yeah. So you never know with the movies. Um, but Bruce Lee, um, Bruce Lee, people don't know this, but he was an early adopter of, of XP and stuff. Um, and he has this wonderful quote about tests. And he said, it's like a finger pointing the way to the moon, right? Don't concentrate on the finger or you'll miss all that heavenly glory. I don't know if I can call this heavenly glory. But <laughs> the point's the same, though, right? If you focus on the tests, you're going to make sure your code works and does what it's supposed to do. But if you look at the bigger picture, if you look at the specifications that you can create instead, then not only does your code work the way you think it does, but it does what it should do, and your business is happy. And they make money, you make money, everybody gets raises, and the world is good. So the short, short of this is the test code you write is actually design documents. It's telling people what the system is supposed to do and how it should do it, and sometimes why it should do it, right? Because you can put all sorts of stuff in those user stories. You can put stuff in the code um, in the tests up here, right, that says, for a method name, I will see comments on the blog. There's, you can put information in there on what's expected, and, and you can say why it's expected. One of the great things about having automated tests like this is that unlike printed documents, and unlike comments in the code, right? if you actually have executable code here that's running things, that's doing things, right? it's always correct. It's always accurate, because if this is wrong, then your code's breaking. Or you're getting flags that your code's breaking when it's not. And you go to look at this and go, wait a minute. That's not what it's supposed to do. It's supposed to do something else. Right? And so the tests, the specifications, are always in sync with the code, which means you can trust them. And if you can walk into a new system that you've never seen before and trust the test to tell you what's going on, then you can do what a young man did on a project I'm working on. He's a new developer. Um, we had to make a change to the system. We were actually changing a data type from big decimal to double. And he's like, I don't know the system. You don't need to know the system. You've got these tests. Go start making changes. So he changed it in the class that, that defines it. And all these tests start breaking. He's like, oh, what am I supposed to do? Make the test pass. Take a test. What's wrong with it? Oh, it's supposed to be double over here. Right. OK, change that. It's passing. OK. Within 30 minutes, he had made changes to like 30 different classes. 
on a system he didn't understand. It all worked fine, and he was kind of happy. He was like, wow, that, that, that's pretty cool. And we were like, yeah, it is cool, right? You've got, some, you've got a safety net that tells you when you've made a mistake and when everything is good, right? So why wouldn't you want to do this, right? I mean, it, 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 and, and really, the only thing that's stopping you from it is changing your perspective, changing your point of view, starting to do it. It's hard to do this on a legacy system, right? Legacy Java system that's never, ne never done it before, it's hard to do that. Why? Because you've got all this code that wasn't written to be tested, right? OK. Secret solution for this. There's a wonderful language called Groovy. Groovy one's in the JVM. It's almost the same syntax as Java. Right? If you know Java code, you can write Groovy code. But Groovy does a couple of interesting things. Um, first, uh, you don't have to be as verbose with Groovy as you are with Java. And it's a little more consistent. Whether you've got an array or a list or a map, it's all a size object. It's a size property. You don't have to, you don't have to figure, is it length? Is it size? Is it what? It's size. right? So they're more consistent. They automatically import a lot of the, the uh, standard things for you, the whole uh, java.lang uh, set of packages. Um, but the important thing is, Groovy doesn't care if something is public or protected or private, which means if you have a class that has some private variables that you need to test, you don't have to use reflection. You can use Groovy. You can reference those things directly. You can set those directly. right? So now your, test, your co code that was not very testable is way more testable. You can access any of the methods you need to. right? With great power comes great responsibility. You know, don't screw things up. But because the Groovy code is just for testing, you don't ship that. You don't have to worry about it. Right? Your production code goes out just like it always has. But now it's in better shape because you can see inside all that stuff that people couldn't look at before at runtime and test. Um, so using Groovy, there's a, a testing framework language called Spock. Um, there's lots of jokes about Star Trek and stuff in with that, but um, Spock lets you write similar tests to, the, to this, um, but it's even easier because in the, uh, in the code, you use labels, given, colon, and you can put a string after it. Uh, I have six books in my, in my uh, shopping cart. When I go to calculate ta uh, the cost, total cost, then I should see a 10% discount. Right? Those lines will show up in a report on when your test passes. And you can see, here's what my, what my test does, right? high level. This is what it's supposed to do. All the code that you need follows those things, but you don't have to see those. So now you've got a document that you can show the business people that says, this is what this class does. This is what this system does. Right? They can understand and go, yes, yes, no, that's not right. It's not supposed to be 10 books. It's supposed to be 12 books. We just changed that. Oh, OK. Right? So you go back, you make your change. And now you've got documentation that the business can read right? that's up to date with what the system does. That's a really powerful thing. Right? Because now you can turn this over to another group for maintenance. And you don't have to teach them all how it works, because they've got this system of automated tests in place, the specifications that say, this is what the system does. And when they go to make a change and something blows up, they can see right then and there. You don't have to come in and diagnose it for them. That saves you a lot of time. right? And I don't know about you, but I would much rather be working on a new system, fixing new things and working on new interesting problems than trying to teach somebody something I wrote two years ago. It's like, I've already taught four guys how to do this. right? So. I hope that uh, you can see that test, testing is a good thing. Automated testing is a really good thing. And if you can turn it into the behavior-driven development, where you're not focused on what does it do, but what should it do? What do I want it to do? How should it behave? Right? That's going to create a big change in your life in terms of what you get to do and, and how much time you spend in those loops fixing bugs that this next group has discovered versus cranking out some new cool stuff. So I think that's it. Oh, yes, before I forget, third-party code. Do you use third-party libraries? Everybody does, right? And one of the nastiest things that has to happen is you've got a production system, and a new version of a library comes out, and the boss says, can we use it? And you say, I don't know, because you know, they've made some changes to the system. It does different things. Well, when you first go to use a library, 
you have to figure out how it all works because the documentation is always wrong, right? So you write some code to test it and see how do I call this thing properly? How do I take those things, put them into tests, okay? Test every way you're going to use that library. And then when a new version comes out, run those tests against that version. If they pass, you're good. If they don't pass, you know why. Everything works but this feature guy, right? And if it's another team that you work with or somebody that you can talk to, you can tell them exactly what you need to have it working. Right? You can send, send them the test and they can see it for themselves. Right? It worked on your old stuff, it doesn't work on your new stuff. It's not my code that's the problem. Right? So that saves you a lot of time. Lets you, so, and you're not stuck and tied to some you know, six-year-old version of a library because we don't know if it works with the new stuff or not. Same thing with APIs, whether it's yours or somebody else's. Write some tests for it. Um, Selenium and Jeb. Uh, if you're doing anything on the web, right, Selenium WebDriver, um, you can use this to navigate through a, a, a website, or through a, uh, a web application. Right? If you're working on a web application, use that to get you to the point where you're having problems, right? or where your new feature is. You know, I have to log in, I have to set up this account, I have to do this and this and this and this and this. Set up a script and let it do it for you in a few seconds while you don't have to worry about all the manual stuff. Right? It's accurate, it's quicker, uh, lets you do other things. And then automated clean deployment, um, not exactly the same as the test, but if you're doing things and you have to deploy stuff to a server, right, and you need to shut it down, clean out all the work directories, all that kind of stuff, and then start it up again, make that part of your build process, right? Have it build a, build a war file, then CD to the directory, delete the files you want to delete, copy the files over, start up your system. It, you, can menu, you can automate the whole thing, and it, it's just a whole lot easier on you. You don't have to worry about all this stuff. You just you know, start your build, and when you come back, it's either up and running or there's a broken build, and you know, you know what to do to fix it. And that's it. So questions? Anything else? Yes? So you're talking about later. You, you come up with it. If you're, uh, you start, start with a business about copying behavior developed. Yeah, for, testing yeah. Okay. There, but you're also going to do the unit testing up at the oh, yeah. end, too. Well, so right. So, it's yeah. It, it, it's layered all the way through. Absolutely. So, your, your user stories, right? That's the big thing. Right. We want to accomplish this. In order to do that, we're going to have to write several smaller chunks, right? There's a front end piece that's involved. There's a middle tier with the business logic. There's a back end persistence piece, right? But this high piece drives the testing in those lower systems and tells you what you need in those lower systems, right? So you write that, that's failing, right? And as you get pieces working and, and, and bits of it start working in, the, in that upper story, right? Then you start going, oh, okay. I'm on the right track. I'm getting more, more stuff is working. Um, but like a Rubik's Cube, <coughs> sometimes to get closer to the solution, you have to back up some and, and it looks more broken than it was. Right. But you can see the advancement. The other nice thing is um, most of these tools will have a, a, a web console that people can view. So if the business guys want to know what's going on, they can look and see what's passing. They don't have to ask you what's the state of the system. Are you done yet? Look at the console. Leave me alone. Let me focus. You know, when it's all green, we're good to go. Any other questions? No questions? No. Oh, yes. I, I, I just like to raise one thing, too, is, is when uh, you have failing tests after new code that you made or something like that, mm -hmm. I think the important point, too, is to understand the test that's failing um, and not just go ahead and change it to make it pass. Yes. Yes. Right, that, that's an excellent point. So yes, if you have working tests and you make a change and something breaks, don't just fix the test right away. Take a look at it and go, now why did that happen? It, you know, you weren't expecting it. I mean, if you were expecting it to break, that's fine. But if something broke that you didn't expect, right, something over here changed, and, right, then you want to think about like, okay, what's going on here? Is there, is there something I've missed? And um, that's another key piece of, of uh, TDD, that write a failing test. If you write a failing test and it doesn't fail, first thing to do is check the test and make sure that your asserts are doing what you think they're doing, right? Because if it's working and you didn't expect it to, then maybe your test isn't actually working the way you think it does, right? Um, so write the test, make sure it fails, right? If you have to, take the code that you're calling and put something in there so that it breaks, right? But make sure the test fails and then make sure it passes. Um, and that way you know that your tests are actually doing what you expect them to do. Because if you've got a test that's going to pass all the time, it doesn't help you at all, right? And it gives you a false sense of confidence. 
So yeah, if the, if the test breaks unexpectedly, think about it. Right? Thinking is always a good thing. And, and we tend to do a lot of it, but sometimes we get in a rush, and then it's like, oh, I'm just going to fix this and, and move on. Right? If there's something really bad, it'll show up, usually in production. Yeah. Yes, sir? Now here's here's the, uh, the, the crux of the problem. How do you get the higher-ups to, to start allowing us to do stuff like this? I'm told, get this code out, get it out fast, do it now. Mm -hmm. And I say, well, I need to do some testing. So I do, I do unit testing okay. down there, but, I, but doing that integration testing, no, they don't want to do that because it takes too much time. And you, get, you have a team out there that's been doing the same thing over and over and over again, and they don't want to, you know, to do this type of extra stuff because they think they know how to do it. Sure, sure. Um, okay, so... How do you get buy-in? Okay, so the question is, how do you get buy-in from... The, the higher level guys who make the decisions about what you should be doing. Um, and the first question I have is, um, if something breaks in production, how expensive is that? How bad a thing is it? Is it something that no one cares and you can just, you know, two days later you can fix it? No. Or does it need to be up right now? It needs to be up right now. Okay. So it's a bad thing if, if production fails? Yes. And, okay. And I've, I've gone through this with them before. Have you had systems that, have you had systems oh, yeah, that failed? We, we have real-time systems that, that, that okay. you know. And they're okay with, They're okay with us I do my unit test and it passes, so let's ship it? No, uh, it's a long conversation okay. about that. But okay. no, they, they, they but don't want to take the time to write tests, but they don't care if we st spend all night trying to fix a broken system. Okay, it's bad for you if the system goes that's down. That's right. It's not ah, ah okay, not bad for them. Yeah, that's that's... The only good solution, <laughs> yeah, I was going to say the only good solution I know for that is to to find some place where what you do is more appreciated, or find where your time is more appreciated. Um, if if they really don't see any value in not waking you up at two in the morning um, to work on a system, then I don't know what to tell you. That that's yeah that's um, yeah. Now, saying that, I've, I've worked on places like that, but I don't do them, I don't work there anymore. <laughs> um, so, yes? Um, does uh, test-driven development take more time? Does, t okay, more time than what? Than, let's say, just, um, like, I, when I write code, I, I have a very short cycle, mm -hmm. and I'm sort of mentally creating a test, and when that condition's met, I go to the next iteration. Okay. But writing tests would seem to me to take about 30 or 40 percent more time. Writing tests takes longer than not writing tests. That's true for writing your code. Um, but what I have found is the time that I don't spend in going through extra QA cycles, the time that I spend, uh, the time that I can spend refactoring my code and making it smaller and cleaner uh, more than pays for that. Like I said, uh, this, this project that I'm working on currently, they expected it to go from September to January 31st to get it out into one store, right? Ten weeks later, we were in a store, and it was working, and the, and the store people were thrilled because we were able to make changes. Uh, they asked, they said, well, can you do this, can you do this? And we were able to make those changes in a short period of time, like a couple of days, whereas previously they would say, well, can you do this, can you do this? And the answer was, well, yeah, maybe, right? So because we have the, um, the safety net of the tests, we can make changes, we can, we can add new features, we can do all sorts of cool things rather quickly and not worry too much about it because if we make a mistake, a test is going to fail and tell us you broke something, right? So it's faster not to write tests if all you want to do is finish the code and hand it off and never see it again. But if you have to deal with that code or somebody else does, it's faster to write the tests first, write the code that you're actually going to need, because the other part is, um, one of the guys that I work with, uh, he said, he, he, I heard him talking to his manager a couple of weeks in, and he said, you know, the really good thing about this is, I'm writing far less code that we don't use than I used to, right? Which sounds kind of crazy, right? It's like, why would you write code that you're not going to use? Well, it's because I thought I was going to need it, but it turned out we had this other piece in place. Or I thought I was going to need it, but this requirement turned out that we don't need it. Oh, okay. If you write just the stuff that's, that, that the requirements tell you you need, then all the code you're writing is useful, and 
right? It's, it's all beneficial. You write just what you need. You've got all the capability to refactor, make it cleaner. You've got fewer cycles through QA and, and UAT and production bugs. Um, so shorter for you, not writing tests. Shorter for the company if you do write tests, right? Boom versus so. I, I always like to try to put it this way. I hate getting the 2 a.m. call. And if I write a solid unit test, integration test, and acceptance test, mm -hmm. I don't get the call at 2 a.m. Right. And um, I think, you know, in the past, we've always, I've always done unit tests, some <coughs> integration, never acceptance. But in this last project we did, um, I was one responsible for doing acceptance. I mean, the whole mm -hmm. range. And even after we did the unit test, even after the integration test, the acceptance test would fire off and you know find something right about once every couple of weeks hmm. somebody and what it was is that it was that one test someone didn't think about or this one particular way which we did it right and the units were solid the right. integration was solid but, but there was one little pathway through that somebody one found pathway through because if you yeah. like if you do an integration in a unit it's everything's kind of co-located but right. what if you're across a network right or uh, a different deployment strategy right and the goal was is just so that all that was part of the continuous integration build. So to get it to full cycle, to get it to release, mm -hmm. then pass A, B, and C. And right. Any of those fail. Stop. Right. And that actually goes back to your question about uh, unit tests versus the integration tests. So a good unit test, right, um, doesn't touch the network, doesn't touch the file system, doesn't talk to outside components. Our unit test tests that one class. Anything you're talking to on the outside, you mock that. You put in a fake that talks to it, and it's very quick, right? Because if you're making calls to the database, you have all the delays and things. And the other thing is, if you're making calls to the database and you want to test that stuff, if you've got a mock, you can say, OK, I want to test what happens if my database connection goes down. I want to test what happens if I can't connect in the first place. I want to test all these things that if you've got a real database connection, you can't necessarily do very easily, right? But the integration test is where you find out, oh, We've got a network delay that's causing this thing to time out. We've got an iffy network, and sometimes I can talk to the database, and sometimes I can't. Right? So your integration test has benefits because you're actually talking to the whole real system. And that may be a way to sell it. Right? It's, oh yes, on its own, all by itself, it works beautifully. But now that I'm talking to the real world, I've got all these delays. I've got noise on the, on the line. I've got you know, all this other stuff that happens that's messy because it's real world systems we're talking with. We've integrated now with third party systems with companies that, you know, are off in another part of the country and the connection between here and there is spotty sometimes or, you know, whatever. So that may be a way to sell the integration test because there's a whole separate layer of benefit right there, right? You're talking to the real systems and sometimes they don't give you the right data. Sometimes the connection goes down. Sometimes they're not there at all. And does our system behave properly or not? And if it doesn't, we should know now rather than 2 a.m. in the morning, you know, 2 in the morning, because it's a lot harder to get people to fix something at 2 a.m. <laughs> well, on their side, right? On the other side. Um, yeah, we're on so. call. Yeah, hate that. Um, okay. Anything else? No. Oh, yes, sir. Yes. Um, Unit so test. Not test. You do a lot of high transactional um, stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I started writing my test to use the constraints from the actual table, database table itself. Okay. So it's a piece of code is like a thousand characters. Um, <coughs> it pulls out of the actual database, you know, layer and says, okay, this field is a thousand characters. And then I start the um, inserts to whatever field. Okay. And I make sure that it matches what the database is, is, is expecting. Mm -hmm. I guess in that aspect, um, I guess this just the way of testing is is coupled with the database itself. Um, I guess I guess that's where I, how I started doing the transactional testing is I guess putting them together because the sure. you know database mapping has to work together. Right. And then I I, I used to store my constraints in like a XML file or something, and then I just decided to just read the constraints in the system itself. Mm -hmm. So when somebody types in, you know. Thousand character field is the data. It, it knows that on the database to only store, you know, a thousand characters and not some XML file where somebody goes and 
came to the database, but they just had the XML file kind of thing. Okay. I guess, um, I mean, I guess when I started coding that sort of testing environment, I, I, I guess I just started out, I started out coupling the, the database with the um, transaction there itself as it right. was doing it itself. Well, okay, yeah, so, so there's nothing wrong with a test like that. It's just not a unit test, right? Because, right. like I said, unit tests need to be very fast. You want to be able to execute thousands of them in a second or so, right? And if you're hitting the database, you're not going to get that. Um, so a test like that, you would run, you know, several times a day, perhaps, but you don't run it every time you do a build. Every time you make a change to the file, you don't want to run that test um, because it, it is slower. Uh, if you need to run something like that, See if you can use an in-memory database, right? Because that's going to be a lot faster than having to go out and hit the spinning disks and, and hit the caches and all and hit the network and all that stuff. It's local, it's in memory, it's going to be a lot faster. Um, so if you wanted, if you do need to do something similar to that where you're where you're pulling stuff from, the, from a, a database, um, use an in-memory database. Um, what? Um, the only thing you need to do is, is, in between your code and the database, put an adapter that you call and say, get me the data, and let that talk to your real database or talk to the in-memory or just mock database, right? Um, and that way your, your production code doesn't change, right? It's the piece that you're talking to to get the data from that changes, right? So it's, it's a dependency injection or, you know, however you want to handle it. Uh, pass, in, pass it into the constructor. Here's my data source, right? Um, so that way you can test it with mock data, you can test it with the real database stuff, uh, you can test it with an in-memory database, and, and your production code has no idea of the difference. That way you can do fast tests and then you can do real live integration tests. Anybody else? No? Okay. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it.